the mute stuff, what do I do with it? Okay. All set to go? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Joanne, and welcome everybody to the May 18th, 2022 meeting of the Danbury Planning Commission. We'll open with the roll call, Ms. Hostetter. Here. Mr. Kyokyo. Here. Mr. Sylvain. Here. Mr. Haas. Here. Mr. Renz is absent. <laughs> Chairman Finaldi is here. Mr. Haas, would you, would you sit in uh, as a regular member this evening? Yes, I will. Thank you. Um, with regard to the accept, acceptance of the minutes, Joanne, I don't think they're done yet, right? No, I, I just I didn't get them done in time to attach them, and I so we'll do them next meeting. No worries. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Thanks. For the record, our next regularly scheduled meeting is going to be on June 1st, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. It's looking like that, too, will be a Zoom meeting, a virtual meeting, um, given the recent spike in, in, in uh in COVID and the uh, number of positive tests, it's looking like that's going to be a virtual meeting. We will confirm that, but um, just make a note of that if you would. <clears throat> a couple of other things, you'll just real quick, uh, you'll notice, notice under continuation of public hearing on our agenda, we had one matter, Pioneer Realty LLC. Also under old business for discussion and possible action, there was one matter, Lauren Draper, as indicated on the agenda. Um, both of those have been continued until the June 1st, 2022 meeting. There will be no discussion or action taken on these matters at this meeting. So if anyone is, is uh, listening this evening for those two items, please make a note of that. <clears throat> um, before we move on uh, to the public hearing, I'll read um, a couple of things. I'll do the Zoom, the, the intro to Zoom meeting first, and then I'll do the legal notice second. This meeting of the Danbury Planning Commission is being held in, on Zoom as a virtual meeting. Even though this meeting is a virtual meeting, members of the public and interested parties continue to have the opportunity to participate in the meeting in a couple of different ways. You can participate via Zoom and see the audio and the video, or you can call in by phone and participate via, video, via audio only. Please be aware that we may have to mute your microphone or telephone to avoid an echo or some other background noise. Instructions on how to participate in the meeting appear on the City of Danbury website and all of the documents and materials that apply to the matters to be discussed during this meeting, including the agenda, are also available on the City of Danbury website. As always, if you have any questions regarding how to participate in the meeting, please contact the City of Danbury Planning and Zoning Department. As a reminder, the entire meeting will be posted on and can be seen on the City of Danbury website. We will follow the posted agenda as per standard practice. If prior to the meeting, any questions or comments on agenda items were submitted via email to the Planning and Zoning Department, those comments will be read during the appropriate portion of the meeting. Finally, please remember that technology glitches sometimes do occur. Please be patient if that happens. <clears throat> okay, with that said, um, the First and only public hearing this evening is the City of Danbury 2022 Draft Affordable Housing Plan. I'll read the legal notice and then I will turn it over to Sharon. Legal notice. Notice is hereby given that in accordance with Connecticut General Statute Section 830J, the City of Danbury has prepared a draft affordable housing plan. The City of Danbury Planning Commission will hold a public hearing for discussion and possible action on the draft affordable housing plan on Wednesday, May 18th. 2022 at 7.30 p.m. in a web-based meeting hosted on Zoom. A copy of the draft affordable housing plan is on file in the office of the town clerk and in the Department of Planning and Zoning for public inspection. It is also posted on the planning and zoning page of the city website through the affordable housing plan committee link. Agenda to be posted will include instructions on how to access the Zoom meeting and application materials and view the meeting in real time on YouTube and if necessary, will note a change in the location of the meeting to the council chambers in City of Danbury Hall, I'm sorry, Danbury City Hall, located at 155 Deer Hill Avenue, Danbury, Connecticut. Arnold E. Finaldi, Jr. Chairman, posted on city website and town clerk office on May 4th, 2022, published in the News Times on May 6th, 2022, May 13th, 2022, purchase order number 2022-174. 
With that said, I will turn it over to Sharon Calitro. Sharon. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman. For the record, Sharon Calitro, I'm the planning director for the city of Danbury. Um, I'm happy to be here tonight to present to uh, the commission uh, Danbury's 2022 uh, affordable housing plan. Uh, before we get into the presentation, just a little bit of history, uh, legislative history. Um, in 2017, um, the statutes were amended to include section uh, 8-30J, which required uh, municipalities to prepare and or amend um, an affordable housing plan. Um, and that plan was to specify how the municipality intended to increase the number of affordable housing developments um, in the respective municipality. Um, PA 2129, which you've heard a lot about over the last um, several months, um, actually amended 8-30J to add a date by which um, municipalities were required to prepare that plan. And that date was um, June 1st, 2022. Um, so while the city at the time of adoption of PA 2129 was organizing to prepare the plan as required, um, it recognized the importance of doing it sooner and, um, um, and how integral it was to, and affordable housing was to the plan of conservation of development, which was also underway last summer. So we decided that the most prudent thing to do was to utilize the services of our consultant um, that was helping us prepare the 2023 POCD update, which is FHI Studio and their team um, who had already done some demographic work and some housing work for us as part of the POCD um, to help us prepare the affordable housing plan. And um, we determined that the strategies and actions that would come from the affordable housing plan would then be incorporated into the plan of conservation and development, um, which made a lot of sense to us. And since the plan of conservation and development was, um, was to be approved by the planning commission under the statutes, it also then made sense for us to come back to the planning commission and ask you to adopt the affordable housing plan because that would then be incorporated into the plan of conservation and development. Um, some municipalities opted to have their legislative body um, approve an affordable housing plan. The statutes are silent on who is to adopt it, just that it needs to be adopted, prepared and adopted. Um, so once we figured out the, the course and, um, and retained uh, FHI Studio and Francisco Gomes, who's here with us tonight, um, we, you know, we got going on the plan and last, late, late last summer, we organized a committee, he'll talk a little bit about that, um, to help us with the plan. Um, and this plan that's before you and the public represents a very collaborative effort of city officials and housing advocates across a broad range and broad spectrum of um, expertise and areas to address the questions on how the city of Danbury um, will meet its affordable housing needs. So we look forward to answering any questions that you or the public might have. And with that, I'm gonna introduce Francisco Gomes. Uh, many of you know him. Um, he is the project manager um, with FHI Studio who is the city's consultant on the plan of conservation and development. And again, we also retain them to help us prepare the affordable housing plan. So I'll turn it over to Francisco. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and I take it everyone can see my screen, is that correct? Yes. Good, yeah, good. Okay, I, I have a fairly brief presentation for you that, that will just walk you through the process that we went through to develop the plan. Uh, some of the findings uh, based, based upon work done by my team and by our sub-consultant, RKG Associates, they are economic development and housing specialists. Uh, and and we're, so we'll review some of the numbers and findings developed uh, by that team. Uh, that really uh, provides the foundation for many of the recommendations of this plan. So I'll take some time to go through that. And, and then finally, we'll, we'll uh, go over uh, the goals of the plan and, and you, you all have had the plan and, and access to the plan. So I, I trust you've had a chance to get somewhat familiar with them, but we'll, we'll, 
we'll quickly go over those once again this evening. Okay. So that the process, uh, Sharon kind of laid it out. We, we started several months ago and uh, we, we had a, a very uh, diverse oversight committee working with us, uh, affordable housing plan committee uh, made up of uh, a lot of different members from uh, different organizations outside the city, internal to the city. Um, so we heard from uh, a lot of different uh, perspectives and, and I think it really helped to guide the plan and, and inform the plan's recommendations. But we spent a few months collecting data and then very quickly put all that together and started developing the plan itself. Uh, we did do community engagement as part of this process and that was comprised of a couple of different elements. Uh, we had an online survey that had very good participation. Uh, we also did a POCD survey that had a housing component of which we were able to um, draw information from that to, to help us in this process. We did a virtual workshop uh, specifically for the affordable housing plan. We also had conducted a focus group on, on housing as part of the POCD effort. And of course that information was really informative to our process as well. Um, so we, we, uh, we've heard from a lot of different individuals and a variety of perspectives in the development of this plan. Okay. Now, if I can get my slides to advance, I'll be able to walk you through the rest. So as I mentioned, our community input um, the affordable housing survey, uh, over 200 participants, over 1,200 in the POCD survey. And um, we, the focus group we conducted included residents, property owners, business owners, board and commission members, uh, and city staff. In addition to that, uh, my team also conducted stakeholder interviews with multiple department heads commission and committee chairs and outside organization uh, directors and advocates um, with, with uh, and that was part of the POCD process, but some of those were specifically focused on housing issues and affordable housing. Sharon already walked through the 830J statute. You know, that's what's really driving the adoption of this plan now. And uh, it, it's shaped the plan itself but it doesn't necessarily drive the need for this type of planning and the need for the, the action that is recommended by the plan. That's a separate issue and I'll, I'll get into that. The affordable housing plan elements, uh, the state has fairly loose guidelines on what uh, the plan should look like and, and what it should be comprised of. Um, there is a guidebook uh, released by RPA and the state uh, we, we, for the most part, follow the guidebook, and, and I think that this plan really meets and, and actually exceeds uh, many of the expectations that are laid out by the state. The, this plan is going to help Danbury address issues surrounding Connecticut Statute 830G. That's separate from 830J, which requires us to do the plan. 830G, for those of you that are not familiar, is uh, the state's goal for communities to work towards achieving a minimum 10% affordable housing stock uh, as very narrowly defined by the state. Uh, the, the repercussions for communities that are not at 10% or don't make sufficient progress towards 10% is that uh, a developer who wants to build affordable housing in that community can bypass uh, local land use regulations. Uh, so it, it's to Danbury's advantage to stay above 10%. It currently is at 11.5%. However, that's not a fixed number over time. Um, by example, with the new 2020 census, uh, there are new housing numbers because there have been housing units built over the past decade that will add to the total supply of housing in Danbury. Uh, however, growth in qualified affordable housing supply has not kept up with market rate housing supply. Therefore, the share of affordable housing supply will likely contract 
uh, in next year's reporting. Uh, in addition to that, there are certain properties that are deed restricted whose restrictions uh, basically uh, expire and they come off of the rolls. Um, and, and some other variables in the equation that cause this number to fluctuate somewhat from year to year. So staying well above the 10% is really important to Danbury so that you maintain control over uh, the type of development in your community, where it's built, the density uh, by which it, it's built uh, and the standards to which it's built. Uh, as I mentioned, it, there's a fairly narrow definition of what qualifies for affordable housing. Uh, and there are a few different types, uh, government housing or government assisted housing. So housing uh, such as um, uh, uh, housing developments built with state or federal grants uh, count towards that. So, um, uh, you know, Danbury's housing built with any state or federal money uh, it would, those units would count towards the government assisted supply. Tenant rental assistance programs like Section 8 or RAP, uh, those vouchers, if used in housing, would also uh, count. Uh, mortgage based, such as Connecticut Housing Finance Authority mortgages, account towards affordable housing. And then finally, deed restriction, basically meaning that. The property uh, is fixed at a certain sales price or, or rental price that is affordable. And, and that definition affordable basically means that uh, households with an annual income of 80% of the area median income or less, something that is affordable to them, provided they spend no more than 30% of their housing cost uh, per month on housing. All right. Um, so let's take a look at the exact supply that Danbury has. And uh, in total, Danbury has almost 3,600 units of qualified affordable housing. Uh, that's out of a total of, according to 2010 census, of over 31,000 units, uh, which puts Danbury, at, as I mentioned before, at 11.5%. And you can see in that pie chart, most of those units are government assisted units, meaning they were built uh, with some sort of uh, government funding or, or housing authority units, those types of units. Uh, rental assistance or vouchers also comprise a large share, about 35% with deed restricted alone and CHFA mortgages, a, a smaller share of that pie. Uh, so I think right away you can see that, you know, there's certain areas, by example, CHFA, uh, mortgage properties that have potential room for growth to make up a bigger share of the housing, affordable housing in Danbury. Now, with respect to uh, some of the trends, of course, Danbury is a growing community. And by virtue of the fact that it's consistently been growing over the past several decades, uh, there's, there is, by virtue of its growth, an increasing demand for housing. And if supply does not keep up with that demand, this is supply and demand economics, then the cost of that housing goes up. And that's exactly what's happened, particularly over the last decade in, how, uh, in, in Danbury, where population has continued to grow, but the supply of housing that's been built has not kept pace with it. And uh, Danbury experiencing, has experienced that over the past decade and probably more acutely so over the past couple of years with uh, an influx uh, due to COVID uh, in migration of people from out of town. Um, that is, we're not yet picking up in census data, but, but we'll soon start to see that. Um, where it is being felt, uh, we believe, is in the cost of housing, whether that be uh, uh, ownership for purchase or rental housing. Um, when we take a look at how household income has changed over time, and, and on the graph on the right compares 2010 to 2020, what we see is that there, Danbury's really grown on the higher income side of things. Um, it, so there's been growth in that area, which means you have more higher income households in Danbury, which also means that it, it, it can drive uh, prices up. Uh, they, those people bring more money for rent, more money for purchase, and it can drive both of those up. 
Um, at the same time, uh, Danbury's contracted slightly on the lower income, uh, the number of households on the lower income spectrums, with, with the exception of one group in particular, and those households uh, earning less than $25,000 a year, uh, the number of rental households in that, in that category is, uh, has actually grown by 9%. So we know there's still need, even though there's more income, there are more higher income households, there's still need on the lower income side of things, yet at the same time, prices are going up. So it's, it's been more difficult for those people, for those households, if they have not experienced uh, growth in their household income over the same period of time. Now, what, what all of that means when we measure it up, and this is the most uh, recent da data available from HUD, uh, and this is a particular data set that is used for affordable housing. Uh, when we take a look at owner households, and that is the, the bar on the top, what we see is owner households are in, in better shape than renter households. And I, I think that would be in some ways kind of logical because many renter households simply can't afford to buy. Um, and a little more than two thirds of owner households are not housing cost burdened. And what, what that means is they spend less than 30% of their household income on housing. However, um, about 30%, a little more than 30% are housing cost burden. 18.8% uh, of owner households spend 30 to 50% of their income on housing and 12% spend more than half of their uh, household income on housing. When we take a look at renter households, and that's the bottom bar, we see it's a, a little more dramatic in that uh, a full 25.5% of those households are severely cost burdened, meaning they spend more than half of their household incomes on housing. Uh, another 25.5% are spending 30 to 50% on housing, with a little less than half uh, uh, spending less than 30%. So I think this graph alone, uh, probably demonstrates what the need is with respect to both uh, household owners and renter households across Danbury. Okay, now I, I'd like to have, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, how it is that we, we identify what is affordable. And, and basically, as I mentioned, this is a definition that comes from HUD that the state uses uh, in their definition as well. And, and that's based upon area median income. And, and for Danbury, the area median income is 104,400. Um, and and it, these numbers I, we pulled from the chart before, and, and what that means is that 35.6% of owner households earn less than the area median income. And two thirds of renter households earn less than this. Uh, so that's a, a, a very significant share and a, a much more dramatic on the renter side, uh, earning less than the area median income. All right, now when we take a look at what those households actually can afford, so what does that mean for a purchase price, by example? This chart goes through the ranges of, of median income, starting at the top row at 30% percent AMI or 30 percent of area median income. Uh, in Danbury, that's 31,300. And then all the way up to 100 percent or more of area median income. So if you are a household making 80 percent of area median income, which is 72,400 a year, um, you can afford a single family house with an FHA loan at 240 of 240,000. And, and more for a conventional loan because a conventional loan requires a much bigger down payment. So that assumes that you have the money for a down payment. Uh, but that's, so that's right about the point where um, the market is really separating the people that can afford and not afford. And if you were to take a look at the sales prices right now in Danbury uh, for the homes that are, are, are on the market, many, many of those are, are well above uh, those limits. And, and so this, this chart really speaks to the need uh, for a, a greater supply of housing that is affordable uh, for uh, 
people that are interested in purchasing a home. Similarly, uh, for rental households, uh, we, uh, there are price points for these households as well. And uh, this is the same uh, system here. Uh, you know, for each row, we have different area median income brackets. And if we take a look at 80% area median income in the middle there, uh, once again, that, that income is 72,400 a year for a household. Danbury has about 2,500 of these households within that income bracket and another uh, 6,000 or more below it. Uh, what is affordable to them is $1,800 a month. However, if you are in a household that is making 30% of the area median income, which is 31,300 a year, and that, by the way, is 31% of, Dan of Danbury's renter household. So almost a third are making only 30% of the area median income. They can only afford a rent of $783 a month. And, and so that, that's where the, the real need is here that we're, we're trying to respond to. The, these are conditions that exist today in, in Danbury. So the plan is, uh, is addressing uh, all of the needs that I just reviewed. It, the plan seeks to, first of all, uh, ensure that Danbury is complying with state statute by meeting 830J, that it's staying above the 10% affordable housing threshold as established by 830G. And I think more importantly, that it, uh, it's guiding the city towards uh, in, taking the steps necessary to support the development of housing that is affordable to all of, all of those households that we just talked about. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll walk you through the components of the plan that, that we feel will help move the city in that direction. And before I do so, does anyone have any uh, questions or comments at this point before I get into the details of the plan? I think we're okay. Okay, okay. All right, the plan uh, starts with the vision statement and um, the, the vision statement is it, just, you know, in one sentence, what is this plan about and what are we trying to accomplish, right? And that vision is that Danbury will foster the sustainable growth of quality housing that will accommodate and be accessible to all residents through different stages of life with a focus on inclusion, equity, and affordability. And, and what, is, what, what is inclusion, equity, and affordability mean? And inclusion means that Danbury uh, has housing for all different demographics and all are welcome and all uh, can find a place to live in Danbury. That everyone has an equal shot uh, of getting housing, realizing that all households are in different uh, circumstances, but they, they all have access to housing and equal opportunity to, to achieve the housing that's uh, appropriate for them. And that's the equity part. And then finally, the affordability part is that they, they are not spending uh, uh, a, a significant share of their income on housing, more significant than they can afford to spend that starts to compromise their ability to put food on the table to pay their bills um, and, and to, to lead a quality life. And that's the affordability part. You know, more narrowly defined, that's 30% uh, or, or, or less of income, ideally people are spending on, on housing. Okay. The plan is organized around six goals. And I'll, I'll walk you through those one by one. And uh, the goals are meant to address everything that we, we, we've talked about to this point. And the first goal is to increase the supply and range of affordable housing in Danbury and to maintain an affordable housing supply in excess of the existing supply, uh, which, which means that, you know, we, we don't want the existing su supply to contract at, at all. We want to grow it and, and maintain it well in excess of that supply. 
we've identified a number of strategies uh, to, uh, to make progress towards this goal. And within the plan itself, it, if um, you are uh, looking at this section of the plan, you will see that we've also uh, identified a priority level and um, uh, responsible entities, you know, who needs to lead this effort uh, as a means of, of guiding uh, implementation of, of these recommendations. So with that being said, uh, does anyone have any questions on the strategies? I, I don't wanna read through all of them. So do you have any questions on the strategies presented as part of this goal? Questions for Francisco, anybody at this point? I guess we're okay. Okay. And a few more, uh, we've, some of these have several strategies that this is one of the more robust goals here. Uh, Mr. Kiyokio, go ahead. You're, you're on mute. You're muted, Bob. Sorry about that. Uh, more of a comment than just than a than a question. Um, just on number number seven there, uh, the accessory dwelling units. I know uh, we opted out of the the state mandate there. Um, just to go on the record, I'm generally not in favor of of those. They seem to think they could get out of hand and cause more issues. Um, but I I do acknowledge that. Uh, it's kind of a du double-edged sword that they it, it can be useful in helping uh, with this plan. So uh, I think maybe if they're uh, if if it's uh, if they're implemented, uh, you know, in a, in a pretty strategic way, then I, I think it can be helpful for this plan. Just a general comment there. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that comment, and I think that it very much is our intention. We we had uh, a fair amount of discussion about of accessory dwelling units in, in our meetings, uh, realizing that the city had uh, regulations allowing them in the past and that there were some issues and so it got pulled back. Um, because because it, it is important that this uh, these regulations are, are developed so as to address affordable housing need and, and also uh, to, to adequately uh, manage the development so that they don't become a nuisance. Uh, that That's really the reason why the city opted out of the state's allowance of it uniformly. And um, here, what we're doing is we're affording the city an opportunity to craft those regulations. So it will best serve the interest of providing affordable housing units um, while at the same time uh, regulating them or managing them so that they do not become a nuisance. And that is very much our intention uh, with this recommendation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> sure. All right, I'll go on to the second goal. Second goal is to maintain and increase the supply of housing designed for or occupied by seniors. And uh, th this is also very important and, and for a, a few different reasons. Uh, first of all, there are many seniors uh, that are in Danbury, have been in Danbury most, if not all of their lives, that really struggle to uh, remain in their homes uh, due to the cost uh, of housing, um, even, even if they have a mortgage that's, that's been paid for long ago. Um, we, we also know that Danbury, like many communities in Connecticut and across the Northeast, is, is getting older. You know, the baby boom generation is, is aging in place. And so that we're seeing a big swell of seniors, of retired seniors and the elderly. Um, and they need uh, a greater uh, range of options for housing so that they can remain in the community, do so affordably and potentially with more services that would be beneficial to them. Um, if housing could be provided to this group, then what that means is potentially uh, the housing they're currently in can be freed up for, for a family. Uh, so it's really important, a part of the ecosystem of housing um, to provide options to seniors. And that's exactly what it is we're trying to address here.
Okay. Uh, unless there are any questions or comments, I'll move forward. I think we're good. Mr. Tabersack, yes, sir. Did you have a question or comment? Uh, I was- Mr. Uh, Chair Mr. Chairman, just one second, Bob. Mr. Chairman, could, could we just, um, with all due respect, Bob, can we get through the presentation with any commission comments and then go to the public with any other comments? Good point, Chairman. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going and then we'll, right. It's just our standard, the standard practice of the public hearing. Of course. We That's can talk later. I'm, I'm used to ceding the floor to Bob, so I, you know. <laughs> All right, uh, goal three is to increase the supply of housing in and proximate to Danbury's downtown with an emphasis on affordable units. And, and what's driving uh, the focus towards downtown here is that downtown has many of the services that uh, low in, lower income households would very much benefit from. Uh, that being great access to transportation, good access to jobs, uh, good access to other services, social services, and it, it's extremely beneficial to uh, families and households with lower incomes to live in a place where they can do so potentially without owning a, a vehicle. And uh, in addition to that, uh, downtown needs more people. And, and so this serves the downtown uh, uh, well um, uh, as, as, as it does uh, lower income households. Uh, so we, we've got a number of recommendations for that. I, I think the goal of this would to be to introduce affordable housing as a component of new housing starts in the downtown. And, and we have some ideas as to how we might do that. Um, uh, you know, one of them would be, and, and I'll get into this on some subsequent slides, is basically uh, establishing a requirement for a minimum uh, number of affordable units to be constructed as part of any larger development. And those are some of the ideas that we're looking at. Mr. Chairman, if I could make a quick comment on this one. Please. Uh, I, I just wanted to note that it's also important for our long-term goal of retaining uh, this younger school age generation that's going to be coming of age in, in coming years that we have attractive downtown housing that's also affordable for them. Thank you. No question. Good point. That, that's a good point, Perry. When, when we talk about households, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty natural to imagine a family household, but uh, a household's also one person or it's two or three unrelated persons as well. And many of those low income households are actually young professionals, right? They're starting their careers. They're, they're not making a lot of money. And in some cases, they're carrying a lot of student loan debt. And, and uh, that, uh, that cohort of people are, are in need of housing that is affordable as well. All right, I'll continue to go for. Goal four is to foster relationships that ensure that the housing needs of the city's most vulnerable residents are met. Um, and, and here, when we talk about vulnerable residents, I, the, the homeless certainly come to mind. And uh, in addition to other populations in the city, we know can't do this alone. So uh, maintaining, building, and fostering those relationships is incredibly important to ensure that uh, uh, the people that need housing in Danbury have housing. All right. Goal five is to administer, educate and support affordable housing initiatives. And there, there's a range of things the city could be doing uh, towards this end. By example, the American Rescue Plan Act funds uh, that were received by the city could be targeted towards housing initiatives. Uh, and those initiatives can take uh, many different forms. I think the, the key element here is that the city is working with partner organizations and is leveraging funding uh, sources that, that are outside the city, of which there, there is a, a good share of federal money right now that's being passed through the state and is available to address 
uh, issues such as housing. Okay, and goal six is to increase the number of homes in Danbury that are accessible to those with mobility limitations or other disabilities. Uh, and, and this, is, uh, this uh, ties back into uh, housing that is inclusive um, and equitable. And, and so here we wanna make sure that uh, everyone who, who needs housing in Danbury has the housing that meets their needs. And part of that is that housing is uh, accessible to people with mobility uh, constraints or, or, or other limitations. And so we have a series of recommendations intended to go above and beyond what ADA and, and uh, designed re requirements currently require uh, to incentivize and, and require uh, really that more units be made accessible uh, for people with different uh, abilities or, or limitations. Okay, that concludes uh, the review of the goals. And of course, uh, you know, the city, the city alone can't do this. Sharon's office alone can't do this. That this really does require uh, a collaborative effort across the city and, and with outside organizations, including but not limited to uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, Planning and Zoning, uh, tax assessor's office, uh, how the housing authority, the housing partnership, and, and other outside organizations, including Open Doors, Fairfield County, and Continuing, uh, Continuing of Care Incorporated. And, and these various entities are identified uh, within the plan in, in, in their role towards specific, assisting with specific or leading specific strategies. All right, that concludes my presentation. Uh, Arnie or Sharon, I'd, I'd happily turn it back over to you. I, I'm not sure if at this point you want to receive uh, comments from the public. Yeah, Mr. Um, Chairman, yeah, we're done. We're basically done. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, we look forward to any discussion and then uh, move forward from there. Yeah, how do I, uh, Sharon, this is a new one for me. I mean, uh, do I ask for people? <laughs> Speaking in favor and in opposition, like I do for a regular public hearing. At the regular yeah, that's what I. Yeah, that's what I would do. That, okay. That's what I would do, and see, you know, and, and see if anybody has any comments, and then we'll circle back with, you know, any responses that we feel are necessary, and then again, we'll we'll ask you to, you know, take the appropriate steps after after that. Okay, so again, like Sharon said, I'm going to ask for those. In, I mean, speaking in favor, speaking against, and then comments. So. If you're not speaking in favor or against, wait till comments and then you can jump in. So with that said, is there anyone else wishing, wishing to speak in favor of this plan? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the um, plan? Is there anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this plan? Anyone in opposition? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to the draft of the affordable housing plan? All right, hearing none, I will open it up to any comments. I think Mr. Tabersack had wanted to say something earlier. Okay, uh, yes, I was on the uh, group that uh, helped uh, uh, get the information and discussion. I think it's so important to realize, which has already been mentioned, the fact that the 10% level is really uh, under what is really needed uh, for Danbury. You know, I think that the information presented in the report shows this. I think uh, we really need the willpower of the Common Council and the city government as a whole to look at what's in the plan. I mean, they're very good ideas in the plan, but let's face it, I've been on many groups uh, where we, the plans were great, but nothing came after them, to be honest with you. Uh, it, uh, you have to have the will to do it. I plead with the uh, Housing Authority and right here the Planning Commission uh, and uh, and uh, and the city government uh, to 
to fix the ordinances uh, needed. Like if you want scattered housing in Danbury, accessory housing, something should be done with that because that's one way to get scattered you know housing rather than everything concentrated in, in in one area and i'm sure other communities have done this i uh, we've had a little apartment on the side of the house uh, that over the years we've rented to people right now we're trying uh housing well we're giving shelter to a family who's just been kicked out um, of their home because of the, the house that they were renting and the three apartments, I believe, were sold to another one who want, person who wants to remodel the building. And right now we're hold, holding uh, for these people who, who are uh, essential workers in their movie. I think that, you know, when you see that 30 percent more that was mentioned before and under 50 percent so many of these are what, what have been labeled as essential workers during the pandemic are really in this group so i think it really takes the willpower uh, to do it but i think the big thing is not to be self-satisfied with the with the 10 percent or 11 percent that we should you know we should always reach as far as we can go and, and with priorities and all but to have a continual uh continuous movement uh, going on so I just hope all you uh, uh, officials can all, all work on this. I'm getting too old for this. I'd, I'd love to see many, many poor people in Danbury uh, be able to pay the 30% of their income for rentals or, or for housing uh, rather than over, uh, over 50%. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Tabersack. Anyone else wishing to make a comment at this time? Anyone else wishing to make a comment? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I had to take myself off mute. <laughs> so this is, this is a very comprehensive plan. Again, um, well done, very well organized. So I want to thank, um, you know, uh, all the people involved, um, Shan Sharon, Francisco, and, and the, the entire team for coming up with this. It's a lot to digest, let alone create. So thank you very much for that. Um, I do have questions. Some of them, I mean, can, we can get past this uh, public hearing and you know approval, whatever. But some of them, I guess, if I could just it, pull out one or two. Um, first of all, I, I want to make a comment on the uh, accessory units, and I guess we've gone through as it's been mentioned. Um, we've had had this in the past, and there was big problems. So the way around that is to create, you know, very structured regulations around it in order to make it um, implement well. Um, I think it's doable, just we really have to be, I would think, strict in terms of what we can allow and what we can't. Otherwise, we're gonna have a repeat of, of what's happened in the past. So that's just a comment. Um, on on um, the goal number one, they have implementation plan here. It's um, number three is uh, partner with, uh, this is increased supply and range of affordable housing, basically. So partnering in, with institutions to establish affordable housing in Danbury. So partner with nonprofits and health systems. So the lead entity in that is health and human services. Um, I'm also wondering where does, you know, uh, public private partnership come in here like where are, there should be private development options as well and I, I'm, I I guess they're covered in here so that's my question is it and where yeah well let, let me uh, I'll take a, a start at that and then Sharon I, I don't know if you want to fill any gaps that I leave okay. here um, so that that specific strategy is is intended to encourage the city to really establish a dialogue and work in partnership with uh, large institutions that are already in the community. By example, uh, your healthcare institutions, major employers. And there's been success in, in, in many other communities uh, of partnerships, by example, uh, in, in I write our, our offices out of Hartford, uh, partnerships with uh, Hartford Hospital and St. Francis in developing housing uh, in, around in those neighborhoods. And that was a partnership with the city, with nonprofit and with the institutions to do so. And in the case of uh, St. Francis, there's an organization on Asylum Hill called NINA and they fix up, uh, they rehabilitate 
old and abandoned houses and they, they have some funding from St. Francis and some from the city and some from the state. And I think that's uh, something we have in mind. Now, with respect to where the private developers come in here, um, there, uh, there is a, a fairly strong market in Danbury right now that is attracting development and private development. And you know, one of the options that we're considering is requiring that affordable, uh, a certain percentage of affordable housing units be built as part of any private development. Um, and so that's, that's where private developers come in. I think we see there are a number of other opportunities for, for private developers to be engaged. And, and Sharon, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Yeah, no, I, I, I was just gonna basically say the same thing that um, there are, there are um, other areas and other cities across the US have, have done the same thing, just as Francisco said, out of Boston. Um, I think they partnered with the healthcare institutions and, and actually built affordable housing, again, like in Hartford. Um, but there, there are also opportunities to partner, you know, not just with institutions, but um, you know, other nonprofits um, to help build affordable housing. Um, um, so, you know, that's, that's what was covered under this uh, strategy in action. Okay, but if this were extended more to, you know, with more focus on private investment though, you know, if with the proper maybe tax incentives and such, I, I don't exactly. know. Exactly. It's like a layering, I think, <laughs> basically. Yeah. I mean, there's, that, there's different, you know, once we kind of uh, figure out um, on the zoning and there might be some incentives um, and, you know, that might be a council thing. And, you know, I just think we have to weave our way through this and layer what we can to incentivize the development because um, we, we don't build how, you know, the city does right. not build housing. Yeah, right? so, how, so how do we get it done? We, we have, have to be to creative in that way. We have to, we have to find money and a lot, you know, a lot, a lot of yeah. private development um, has has the funds. They just need the uh, incentive, so to speak. So I don't know how. Yeah. I, I guess that might be. You're saying that's sort of a sub subtask under um, uh, under these strategies here. I guess. Well, I think they're they're in 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 several different ones. For instance, an inclusionary zoning requirement um, often has a, a, an example of, of the Stanford below market rate program requires some percentage of affordable housing, um, in every new development over 10 units, the percentage varies depending on what zone you're in. I mean, that, that that's specific to them, but again, there is also, um, um, the opportunity, um, to pay into, so they, so a developer, instead of actually building the unit, pays the equivalent value of the unit into a trust fund. Um, and Danbury actually has a housing trust fund. Um, and that trust fund then can work with nonprofits that build housing. So, uh, you know, they, there can be grant opportunities to, um, uh, to nonprofits or other organizations that actually do the building. So it, it, it becomes the money that the city uses to build housing without the city being the builder of the housing. Okay. So, so again, it's various different ways to um, kind of approach it. Um, and, you know, it, we, we just need to look at that, but they, they've worked in other municipalities and I think they're worth looking at here. Okay, good, great. Okay, I mean, just, um, I guess one more. I have a number, I guess after this or whatever, I think, I don't think it's a, not any of these are showstoppers, but I do have one other one that I just, maybe if somebody could comment on this. So on, on page seven of the plan, it says as of 2020, Danbury had 31,074 household, uh, households. And then in, in italics, it says Danbury's number of households is fewer than its total number of housing units it's due in part to housing, housing vacancies across the city. So I, I, I subtracted housing um, units, let's see, uh, from uh, households, from housing units, and I came up with 2,500 vacant housing units. So my, my question is, is, you know, is this a constant that we have this? Is it, does it, um, how, you know, is there a lot of turnover there that we can't really get at those 2,500? Um, is it a trend and are we addressing that in any way? Because 2,500 units vacancies is maybe taking, worth taking a look at as is proposed here in the, 
you know, in the plan. I don't know. If yeah, Helen, you're, you're pointing to a, a really important statistical line item that uh, people often have questions about. So uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the census vacancy uh, number and to put it into some context. And, and the reality is the houses that are actually vacant right now, the units that are actually vacant is, a, is probably a much smaller number. Uh, this, and and we, we can only work with the data that is available to us and the best data that we have, and that would be the census data. Uh, however, uh, the census will record any unit as vacant that they are not successful in getting a response from. Uh, and there, there's a, a few other metrics that they use uh, when they send people out to actually door knock. If it looks like no one's living there, wow. they'll record it as vacant. So that number is often inflated and it's often more inflated in, in, in cities and in cities that have, um, that have uh, uh, residents who come from out of the country and are avoiding uh, door knocks, uh, right? Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we see that number. There's a gap there between the number of households and the number of housing units. So what we actually think is that there are more households in Danbury in that uh, probably a significant share of those vacancies are actually currently occupied, but we just don't have solid numbers on that. Um, so we don't think that there is that big of a supply of housing that's sitting vacant. Uh, otherwise, to your point, it's, well, why don't we do something about that or do something with it? Um, that number it, it, it very well could be less than a thousand. And, and that is owing to um, sometimes uh, some seasonal vacancies, you see it a little less so in Danbury than you would on the shore. Um, uh, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, uh, a household that's just in between uh, tenants, in between owners, whatever it may be, uh, a household that is uh, in, in disrepair and is not occupiable or has been condemned. There, there are a lot of, of different reasons. Um, I, I think the, the strategies we've laid out would incentivize and, and provide opportunities for, um, for occupying vacant unit, units that are truly vacant for occupying them. And, and I think that if Danbury is successful in bringing more affordable uh, units to the city, then uh, you know, it, it's going to address the issue regardless of whether or not that census number technically still stays in that range. All right, that's, thank you very much for that explanation. Appreciate it. All right, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Paul. Paul Rotello, committee member, Danbury resident. Um, you know, for the last eight months, the committee has been wrestling with this, and there's just been a tremendous amount of debate uh, back and forth on, on how we're going to proceed going forward, 830G, 10%, 11%, 12%, um, and, and, and many other factors, too. And, it, and at this point, we're sort of handing it off to the, the actual people who are going to vote on it, you guys in the planning commission. So I'm, I'm more than willing to step back and, 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 and let you guys have this debate. But I, I just want to reassure you, um, without editorializing about what our neighbors have done, what West Cog has done, we've all read the articles in the paper about this. I think coming out of Western Connecticut, this is, if not the best plan, one of the best plans. But I personally happen to think this is the best plan. And while it's possible to move in, in a little bit move a little bit in either direction towards towards uh, facilitating more housing or tightening it up a little bit to, to provide some relief for the for the taxpayers and Dan and the people who may have some concerns about this. I think a lot of a tremendous amount of effort and thought went into this. I think it's a very good plan and I'm, I'm just very happy that you guys are taking this seriously and listening to the questions that people have brought up after Francisco's presentation, I, I realized that they're beginning to dig down in this and it's and it's wonderful to watch this process now from almost from a, a um, from a spectator's point of view as, as opposed to a participant. But I think this is a solid plan. I think it's a great beginning, a reminder that we have to do this now every five years. So we'll be continuously refining this 
Um, and I think that Danbury is in a unique position where it's offering housing in excess of what our neighbors are offering. Um, and, and I think that as we continue forward, we will find a way to have enough housing for our workers, our residents, our seniors, and we're moving in the right direction. I, I, I'm proud of this plan. I, I'm not, I'm not a, a hack booster. I, again, a lot of work went into this, but I think this is a great and auspicious start for the city and even for the region. Uh, the region. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else like to make a comment at this time? Mr. Chairman? Please. Uh, this plan laudably and necessarily addresses uh, affordable housing as it's defined by statute uh, and also uh, looks at um, certain constituencies in the city of Danbury, such as the elderly and uh, the lowest of incomes. But this plan uh, appears to be more than just affordable housing under the statutory definition and goes beyond that to address housing in Danbury. And uh, one of the slides, it looked like 66% of renters in Danbury can afford only 1,800 or less. And so my question is, and maybe I missed it, um, where in the plan does it address less costly housing as opposed to statutorily defined affordable housing? Where does the plan address um, allowing um, projects of less costly rental units um, outside of downtown as well as in the downtown? Yeah, that, that's a fair question. Let, let me do this. I, I'm going to go to the, the goals and strategies section. I, I'd like to just call out a few of the strategies that I think uh, will be beneficial in moving uh, in that direction. And, and I tell you, you can see the document that I have on screen, correct? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right. So let's let's start with let me get to the right page here. Let's start with goal one. And this is to increase the supply of affordable housing. Um <clears throat> and, and let me let me go down to uh item item two, and, and that is uh vouchers. Uh, housing vouchers. Danbury right now has uh, more vouchers available. This would be Section 8 and, and wrap vouchers uh, than it has housing units for. Uh, so by, by doing a much better job of tracking the, the vouchers that are available and connecting people that are holding eligible vouchers but can't find housing and connecting them with housing, we can we can accommodate many of those households. So the 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 state the federal money is there, and they just can't find uh, housing. So just by adding any kind of housing, market rate housing, because these people have vouchers, they can be in market rate housing under a certain price point. It doesn't have to be uh, qualified affordable housing. They are they bring that with them. They bring that designation with them by adding supply. Uh, you're adding affordable housing. Uh, strategy three, partnering with institutions. While this admittedly, this is going to take years, right? Um, the idea here is to bring uh, affordable housing online. And, and with it, it, it may come a range of housing price points as part of a larger development. Um, the, the idea is in a partnership with institutions might help to close the gap between the feasibility of a private developer constructing something, uh, cl close that financial gap and make it feasible for them to construct something that has affordable housing as a component. Uh, item four, the inclusionary zoning would actually require and potentially require in any development that occurs with housing that a certain percentage of that be affordable. So those, those are units that would be guaranteed if that were implemented and adopted. Uh, item strategy five to revise zoning regulations and relax dimensional requirements. Uh, while this is just for the downtown area, uh, this could potentially allow more units to be built. And because more units can be built on the same property would bring down the cost per unit. Um, so that would, it makes development all the more feasible. Uh, 
Finally, we, we've taken a look at some other citywide uh, zoning things that could be done. Uh, item six is a, a couple of different regulatory tools in the zoning right now, including a district. Uh, revisions to that would uh, provide greater flexibility uh, for higher density housing uh, to be built. The higher the density, generally, the lower the, the price point can be. Um, and then also, if we talked about accessory dwelling units potentially being a very important a component of that. I, I think all of those alone, I, I think uh, directly address uh, the concern that you have and the, the issue that you point out, just the, the overwhelming need for housing that is not just qualified affordable housing, but is affordable to that large uh, constituent of people that are um, you know, well below the area of median income. Um, and and we our, our other goals, I, I think, you know, go go towards addressing those needs as well. While we're, we're here, we're, you know, we're talking about seniors. You know, I talked about the role that that has in ensuring if you add supply for seniors, you could potentially free up the housing that they are currently in. That adds to supply uh, and we're back at you know, supply and demand economics with that. Um, you know, we have the downtown we talked about uh, the most vulnerable residents. Uh, there is a role, there's an existing uh, need that is currently met by partner institutions, outside organizations, and the city needs to remain engaged with a partner to ensure that they continue to operate and provide uh, housing and shelter for the most vulnerable residents. And then finally, goal five is really uh, is about uh, the city really staying focused on all of its programs and ensuring that they, they are all doing what they're intended to do um, and leveraging the funding that's out there to direct towards uh, affordable housing. And, and finally, uh, goal, goal six, um, it, you know, we're here, we're trying, you're, you're correct, we're, we, we're taking a broader approach. And, and here we're not talking about just affordable housing, but we're talking about providing housing to people that have very little choice in their housing. And we, we think that's uh, a really important part of this plan. So when we talk about this plan of meeting and exceeding what the state is asking us to do, that, that's what we're talking about in this case. Well, maybe I wasn't very articulate in what I was asking because I think what I'm asking is we talked yeah. about a, a demographic such as trying to keep uh, young Danbarians in Danbury once they graduate from school yep. and uh, maybe young professionals and others who are right on the cusp of that, that third tier of renters. And so my point was, in this plan include encouraging and perhaps uh, being open to zoning changes that would encourage um, one bedroom and studio apartments that fill that niche that I think is a fairly large niche. If in fact, this is a housing plan that goes beyond just increasing the number of 8-30G affordable units. I think that's, that's really what I was articulating. And I may have been inarticulate in my response to your question because I, I do feel that the plan does. Uh, I, I genuinely- oh, Maybe uh, item five and number one, yeah. Yeah, I, well, I, I genuinely believe that it does just by virtue of the fact that we, we are looking to facilitate the development of more housing with affordable housing as a component of that. And when we talk about uh, affordable housing, we're, you know, we, as I acknowledge, uh, young professionals are, need affordable housing as well. Uh, so we're not, we're not targeting a demographic, we're targeting low income households of which uh, there is actually, that's a very broad demographic. And, and so we're talking about housing for them too. I, I, it's, I think it's important to note that the affordable housing plan, while it, its focus is affordable housing and its priority is, is to provide uh, and encourage the provision of housing that is defined as affordable by the state, um, is one component of the ongoing work that's being done uh, towards providing more housing in, in Danbury in general. And we, we're also doing work through the plan of conservation and development of which we have a whole section uh, uh, targeted towards housing. 
Um, that section is currently in development. It rolls into it many of the recommendations of this plan, but it also takes a much broader uh, uh, view on housing. And it looks also to provide, uh, uh, to incentivize the provision of market rate housing and, and housing that is maybe just uh, slightly below market rate, but not qualified as affordable. Um, so I think Danbury needs more housing of all types because there's a tremendous demand right now and the supply really has not kept up over the past decade, despite the fact there's been some big developments, some development on the west side, a little bit development downtown. The supply has not kept up with the demand. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Mr. You're Chair. Welcome. You're welcome. Would anyone else like to make a comment at this time? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. I don't um, know who that, that, who is that was Perry. Oh, go ahead, Perry. <laughs> I'm glad Mr. Beecher asked those questions because um, in, first of all, uh, being part of the committee was a great experience and I was very impressed by the diversity of the people on the committee and the, the wealth of knowledge they brought to it. I, I'm a big, big fan of this plan. I think it addresses a lot of Danbury's needs outside of just the requirements of A30G like uh, Mr. Beecher brought up. But um, the alarm bells went off for me, both here and at the POCD. And a few years ago, when I first heard about this housing burden, burden issue uh, that we have, that's kind of pervasive in Danbury, uh, the fact that I think somewhere around 40% of our residents are housing burdened. To me, the, the sirens are going off that as a community, we gotta get building. Um, the, the trickle down effect of, you know, the lack of disposable income going back into our economy, the lack of saving for higher education, those effects won't be seen for years, but we need to address this need now so that we don't see those uh, effects down the road. And, um, you know, of, of course, we need to increase always uh, our supply of affordable housing. But to Mr. Beecher's point, um, we need to get building in general to bring that, that overall average price point down uh, and make a, a housing affordable for all. Thank you, Mr. Sylvain. Anyone else wishing to make a comment at this time? Um, hearing none, I'll just add in my two cents. You know, I, I, I too think the, uh, the affordable housing plan is an excellent plan, very well thought out, uh, very well presented. But I'm struck by what a, um, a tricky and complicated and um, vexing issue this this is the issue of, of affordable housing, you know, and, and on top of it, you know, the old saying timing is everything. Whatever the issue was pre-COVID is even, even more complicated now because of the COVID bump in real estate values in our area. And um, everyone's house is worth more over the past couple of years. So, so it took a, a, a problem and, and made it a little worse in terms of affordability. Um, but I, I too um, give a lot of thought to the idea of young people uh, who want to live in Danbury, whose families are perhaps from Danbury, but just can't afford to do so. It's, uh, it's, it's very heartbreaking to, to think that. I myself have two kids that graduated from Danbury High. Um, one's 31, one's 28, one lives in Florida, one lives in New York. It, it, they, they just couldn't live here. They just couldn't, um, couldn't afford to live here. Um, it's, very, it's very tough. Um, Francisco talked about the laws of supply and demand. It's, it's you know, and we obey the law. So we, we, we know about the laws of supply and demand. And the, the simple truth is that Danbury, as I mentioned uh, at previous meetings, it could be argued that we're a victim of our own success. People like Danbury, people want to move to Danbury. Our population grows. It's nice to know our community is viewed as a desirable place to live. However, if the population grows way in excess of the supply of affordable housing, you've got a big problem on your hands. So the last thing you want to do is have a less desirable community to live in, thereby bringing prices down. <laughs> so therein lies your, your vexing problem. Um, there were several references uh, to the idea of changing zoning regulations or amending zoning regulations, and that we're going to have to do some of that. But um, some of us who have been around planning and zoning a while know that we have to proceed with a great deal of caution when we do that uh, because of we have to anticipate every conceivable unintended consequence of doing that. And we've seen instances where 
well-intentioned zone changes haven't worked or haven't had the effect we want them to have. So while we have to do that, we have to be very careful when we do. A good example is um, requiring a, 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 you know, a certain percent, of, uh, requiring a private developer to set aside a certain number of units to be affordable, very laudable um, goal. But would that create a disincentive for a developer at a time when we we're trying to do everything possible to build up, as was said earlier. And we need more housing units of all kinds, of all sizes. So I'll just wrap it up by saying, great effort. Um, we're gonna all continue to work together. Those of us who've been doing this for a long time, complicated issue, no easy solution. And um, this is a great, a great step toward, um, to, to, toward helping with that issue. So thanks to all. And in particular, not only Francisco, but everybody that was on the committee everyone in the planning and zoning department. Great effort, great plan and great comments. So thanks to all, very good. I'll thank you. ask- thank, Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if there's any additional comments. Um, I, I, I guess I just wanted to say that, you know, this is our toolbox in a sense. And, um, you know, we'll, we, we we gotta continue to, you know, look at what our options are. And as you said, assess, you know, every um, every idea, you know, goes through a whole series of iterations on what could possibly happen. You know, we, we do do that, but we wanted to lay out all the things and all the possibilities um, that could help us increase um, the affordable housing um, and address the affordable housing issue. And again, these strategies um, and actions are become part of the plan of conservation and development, which has a, a housing section that addresses housing, other housing go, um, housing strategies, and um, it, it are incorporated into the economic development section of the plan um, in terms of being creative and, and being flexible in terms of um, considering any zoning changes for additional uses. So I think um, in the grand scheme of things, this, this fits in. So um, I appreciate all of the comments. And if there are no additional comments, I would ask, respectfully ask the commission to um, close the public hearing and move it to old business um, for discussion and possible action. Number two, your own old business. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, commission members, unless there's any other discussion, I'll entertain a motion to close this public hearing. I will I'll make that motion. Okay, I'll second. Sounds like Mr. Kiyokio made the motion and, and Ms. Hofstetter seconded it. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 This public hearing is closed. I'd like to, um, ask for a motion to move this to, to item two under our old business agenda. So Mr. Moved. Chairman, so moved. Second. So. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go with Helen and Perry. <laughs> that one. Love it. Okay, motion made and seconded to, to move this to item two under old business for discussion and possible action. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Oppose, this matter is moved to item two under old business. All right, and thanks again to everyone. Well done. Big issue, huge issue, and um, being Thank tackled you. by. Very well done. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to continue with our agenda. As I mentioned, under continuation of public hearings, Pioneer Realty LLC, that matter has been continued into the June 1st meeting, so there will be no discussion or testimony on Excuse that. Excuse me, Ms. Mr. Chairman. Could Francisco yes. stop sharing this screen now? I will. Okay, only because I can't see everybody while we're doing it. And I know I don't need to, but it makes it easier for me. Thank you. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. Okay. I just mentioned um, that the, the matter of Pioneer Realty LLC will be cont uh, continued until the June 1st meeting. Um, moving to our old business agenda, uh, the matter of Laurel Draper has also been tabled until the June 1st, 2022 meeting, as I mentioned earlier. So we will go right to item two under old business. Uh, which of course was the city of Danbury 2022 draft affordable housing plan. Um, commission members, unless there's any discussion or, or actually, no, we're not voting. Uh, we're, um, yes, we are voting. What am I saying? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> this thing really threw me off. Uh, me off. Okay. Commission members, unless there's any other discussion, um, we will take a vote on the acceptance and approval of the, um, 
City of Danbury draft affordable housing plan. Um, Mr. Chairman. Please. Do you want a motion for that or? Yes. Sure do. Yes. Sure do. yes. <laughs> okay, I'll make a motion uh, for a, to approve the uh, City of Danbury 2022 draft house, uh, affordable housing plan as discussed. Thank you. Seconded okay. by Mr. Payne. Great, thank you, Perry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a procedural question. Yes. Um, if we approve this and there's any changes, to, this is so, you know, big comprehensive plan and there may be some changes, but not huge, uh, I'm sure, because this is, you know, the high level view anyway, but suppose there are changes. I mean, are, do, can we do that after the fact here? Say there's a conflict between this and the POCD for whatever reason, we have to fix this, you know, make it more aligned or something. Like a change, any kind of change. Is, is, are we in cement here or can we, should we add something that says, you know, change, small changes, you know, fine. I, I don't know what the procedure well, is. Well, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a grammatical error or a, something like that, I don't think that that's any big deal, but uh, this is the plan we're voting on. Um, we're not gonna bring it back. Um, no, I know. I, well, I guess I, I might be getting into the weeds, but you know, I, there were a few yeah. other things I've, but if it's if we're allowed to make small changes like grammatical ones, and there was entity an entity question where we had two people who were lead, and I don't know if that's really I mean I don't know if that's the best thing to do, but stuff like that. I mean if we change if we change anything, we're allowed I guess unless unless what I don't know. Well, no, I mean, this is you want, the, you want me to comment this. on that, Mr. Chairman, if I can. Um, um, so I would just say that we're asking, you know, that this would be the approval of the plan as presented. And then if we let's go through the POCD process, get through with that. If, if there's something that comes up in the interim, it doesn't, I don't think the statutes preclude you from going back and amending the plan at some time in the future. It only requires you to do it every five years. So right. I, I, I would just, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the City of Danbury 2022 Affordable Housing Plan. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. The City of Danbury 2022 Affordable Housing Plan is approved. And again, I thank everyone. Tremendous effort. A lot of work went into this. Absolutely. And uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Chairman. Sharon. Really, as, as part of the committee, thank you guys so much. Yes, Paul, Bob, right. everybody you really contributed a lot. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, looking at our agenda, there's only one other item, really. It's the referral. Um, wait a minute now. It's the <laughs> this is what happens when you get up at five in the morning. I'm telling you, <laughs> I need to coffee or something. Are we doing a referral tonight, Jen? Mr. Chairman, yes, you're going to do uh, referral number two, and That's I think right. Sharon's going to handle this one, unless okay. you want me to, Sharon. No, I'm here. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so looking at our agenda, the first, the first 824 referral, as you noticed, was withdrawn by the applicant. We will do the second one, and then the third one shown will be discussed at the June 1st meeting. So under referrals, number two, 824 referral, May City Council Agenda item number eight, license agreement for use of city property, Old Sherman Turnpike. And I guess it goes to Sharon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so city council received a request um, to consider approval of a license agreement, which would allow CPD Properties Inc. Um, to use 2,857 square feet of city owned property, which is located at the corner of Old Sherman Turnpike and Newtown Road. And they are the property owners associated with, the, I believe there's a, um, I think it's a shell station um, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but it's a gasoline a gas station at the corner. Um, and while they had indicated in their letter to council that they did, um, they had developed a site plan, they really, they have not um, submitted that site plan to the department. So we really haven't reviewed it. Um, we did look at the agreement the draft agreement that was submitted to council and the plans that were attached to that, which showed the proposed license area and a concept um, plan. But again, um, the department has not officially reviewed a site plan. The concept plan showed parking spaces in the area that they are desirous of leasing, of like being under the license agreement. 
um, and that they would need those spaces to meet the requirements for redevelopment of that site. And again, I don't really know, we don't know what the square footage of the whole development um, is or what those uses are. So I can't confirm whether seven spaces, as I indicated in the memo, or that, uh, you know, whether they meet them all or not, but that's what they've indicated. Um, there is an existing driveway if you know that site. So you turn right into Old Sherman Turnpike or you go straight on Newtown Road. If you turn right into Old Sher Sherman Turnpike, there is a driveway uh, entrance into the site um, from that area. And um, the proposed draft license agreement that was submitted uh, also included amongst other terms, um, the provision to allow signage to be constructed within that leased area. And as you may recall, we have in the past, the city has approved similar license agreements or easements um, relative to use of land adjacent to um, sites for parking to meet the needs of that property owner. And in this particular case, I think um, as, in, uh, as with others, it's important for the city, there's two important issues. Um, whether or not the city needs that land in the future for roadway improvements, in other words, the, should you license, should you allow a license uh, for use of an area that you might need next week to <laughs> widen the road? Um, and um, again, roadway improvements, I think are best managed um, uh, or determined by the Department of Public Works. And I think this was indeed referred to um, Public Works Department um, for that. Um, and uh, as well, Old Sherman Turnpike had some improvements, if, again, as you may recall, related to the Amazon facility. So that there has been some work, although I don't know if there's any additional work um, that needs to be done. Um, Newtown Road, as you know, is controlled by the state. Um, so we don't really have much uh, control over that. Um, and second, from a planning and regu regulatory standpoint, in this particular case, because it's needed for required parking, um, what happens to that property if the city in two years under the lease agreement, need, you know, they need to terminate that agreement and they take the land back and now the, the, the site is non-conforming. Um, so at a minimum, we thought that, that there's some, there should be some acknowledgement of that in the license agreement. Um, you know, you, you find more parking on your space or understand that you're going to become non-conforming and that has a repercussions. Um, in addition to the above, as I indicated, um, there, there's a provision for signage and the way the agreement was transmitted to us from the council, it indicated that the language, I think they meant shall meet all the requirements and be approved, but it just said shall be approved by the appropriate authority. And that to me reads like no discretion and we should have discretion obviously to determine that it meets the requirements of zoning. Um, I have to say, I, I, I understand that some, um, a revised document was submitted after I prepared this staff report um, for you. I did not go back through that for a variety of reasons and time was the most important. So I don't know that it indeed addressed that, but um, they can take up any revision to a draft agreement um, at an ad hoc of council. So um, again, assuming the Department of Public Works doesn't object to the license agreement, they have no immediate need for the land um, for roadway improvements. And the document is revised to acknowledge that the nonconformity which may occur and that um, the signage language is tweaked a little bit. Um, we, and, and obviously that the documents meet the requirements and are in form and content acceptable to the Office of the Corporation Council. We don't object um, to a positive recommendation um, on this referral. So the document has been revised. We just um, we just can't confirm yet that it's been revised for the, for the two things that the, to indicate that the Department of Public Works doesn't object to the license agreement and that the land isn't uh, immediately necessary for roadway improvements. So we don't we don't have the report back from Public Works, so I don't know what they may or may not say. The document revisions that I had suggested had to do with the acknowledging the nonconformity and changing the signage language. Um, All right. But I, I don't know what Public Works will come back and report. So assuming they don't object and we can tweak the agreement um, to satisfy those 
to, from a planning perspective, those were, I think, the issues because there's terms in that agreement that really are not planning related. So um, I've just looked at, you know, the signage um, language and, and more importantly, or as importantly, the issue of, you know, becoming non-conforming. And, and we do have that scenario, you know, we have that situation on other sites, which, you know, at I just want to about, yeah. if somebody makes a positive referral, a motion for a positive referral, it's, it's got to be conditioned on all that stuff, right? It's yeah. got to be conditioned yeah. on the signage line. <laughs> The signage issue, the non-conforming issue, the public works issue. So it's kind of an awkward, it'd be kind of an awkward approval of positive recommendation. But we can make it. We just have to make sure that the, um, like you said, the, uh, the, the revised, the, the, the document is revised to reflect all of your concerns. Right, right. And we can, we can do, we, we've done that before. I mean, we've looked at revised documents. It's just, it went to council in <clears throat> one form and council sent it to us. So for us to be reviewing, irrespective of time, um, for us to be reviewing revised documents that council hasn't submitted, to us, I mean, there's a time for that to occur and um, it need not be now. I mean, it, you could do it at the ad hoc of council, but you, you just need to make your referral and we've done it before in this fashion. Okay, anyone wanna take a shot at that referral? <laughs> if, if you just go to the last paragraph, <laughs> of my memo that might help you. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. I just have a couple of questions first. Sure. Um, so will this plan come before the commission at some point or is it not, does it meet the regulations that would have to come to us? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I don't know if it's just a, a site plan or it's Tom's nodding his head because he represents the developer, but I, I, if it's a special exception, yes, it comes to you. If it's a regular site plan, no, it doesn't come to you. But I think mm -hmm. I think the issue is it's a chicken egg thing at this yeah. point. If if they need the parking to meet the meet the requirements, they can't submit the plan because the plan doesn't comply. So they wanted uh -huh. to go to council first to see if the license was acceptable. Um, and if they got the license, then they would submit the site plan. That's uh -huh. what I'm assuming is happening. I just you know. Uh -huh. Uh, do you know if there's an existing driveway that goes across that land or, or that's yes. a proposal? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. I have to plan. So they're already kind it, of using The driveway the is there, but let me look and see if it crosses the lease. Yes, it crosses the lease area. Yes, it does. So they're already kind of using that property. Exactly. Area. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I, maybe I didn't understand. So did the council approve this already or not yet? They're waiting for no, our- No, no, they sent our... it to a referral and okay. to an ad hoc committee. So a referral because it's a, you know, the 8-24 referrals, it's, it doesn't say the license, but it doesn't necessarily, I, I don't even know if it said lease, but it's a use of city property for something other yeah. than like for, a private developer. So in my opinion, it needed to come to you under an 8-24 referral because that's the purpose. Should city-owned property be used for something else? Yeah, um, so okay. that's why you have it. And then so they did reports from planning, from um, public works, and I believe sent it to an ad, ad hoc committee. So yep, yep, we'll be okay. meeting on that. Got it. Um, I, I haven't really looked at the license agreement or I would just caution, I guess, that there should be some um, concern about the liability. If someone hits the sign or causes injury or property damage that it's on city property, so they shouldn't come back to the city. And because I remember we couldn't put a sign up in my neighborhood because it was on city property because of that liability issue. So it's kind of strange that they would allow a sign to go on this property. So it just, I just want to make sure that that liability issue is looked at for the sign and everybody like the corporate uh, corporation council is, is yeah I mean okay. you can include that in term um, you could just add to what I've said that um, in, in any agreement includes in, um, uh, indemnifications for the city as yes appropriate by corporation council something like that yep okay. Okay, anyone want to take a shot at making a motion? I'll give it a try. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. Uh, I'll make a uh, motion for a positive referral, I guess, subject to uh, 
uh, Department of Public Works agreement and uh, acceptable language in the license agreement pertaining to uh, sign language and indemnification and all appropriate documentation acceptable to corporation council. Nice, Bob. Well done. I like that one. No motion's been and made. Do I can I just like can I just add for one second in the non language regarding the nonconformity non acknowledgement of the of the, the non throw that in too. Okay, okay, good. Thanks. Bob's motion is so amended by Mr. Savay. Looks like he's seconding that. I would second that, including Sharon's comments. Thank you. Very good. Before I take the vote, full disclosure, your chairman worked at that Shell station when he was 16 years old. I think they paid me $2.50 an hour. And I, want I did to too. I was worth every penny of it. Every I did penny. too. Gas was 33 cents a gallon. Oh. <laughs> ah, <laughs> <kill me. laughs> All right. I know. Our motion <laughs> seconded for positive referral. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 It's better because it's a positive referral. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. A um, couple of other things under for reference only. Um, otherwise, we are done. Is there anyone that has anything else to come before the commission? Hearing none. Hey, Teddy, I really did work at that shell station, by the way. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll anything? make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Motion made and seconded to adjourn. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Well done. Thanks, everybody. Good job.